thank you very much for this for this kind introduction. Yeah. Um, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this really interesting conference. I'm, I'm very glad um, to be here. And um, I should say thank you as, uh, as well for offering me a um, couple of minutes of extra time <laughs> uh, for my presentation. I hope I will put that to good use. In 1869, the epigraphist Ulrich Köhler, who a few years later became one of the first directors of the then newly founded German Archaeological Institute at Athens, briefly published the votive inscription of a square pentelic marble base that he discovered on the Athenian Acropolis in an area between the Propylia and the Brauroneion, so some, roughly somewhere here. Its original location remains, of course, an open question, and you can see this, this particular base to the left in a drawing by Rudolf Heberdai as published in Antony Raubicek's dedications from the, from the Athenian Acropolis. Kula noted the high quality of the stonemason's workmanship, but frowned upon the, in his eyes, Ungeschicklichkeiten, the clumsiness of the inscription that starts in the center of the block and then, for lack of writing space, turns 90 degrees at the right corner to continue along its vertical edge. To Kula, this arrangement was the product of a mere accident owed to the lack of practice by the stonecutter. For its historical contextualization, however, the otherwise plain text of the dedication, Kalias Hipponico an Ethican, posed no significant problems. Already Köhler convincingly identified the donor with a well-known member of the urban elite of early classical Athens, and on the basis of the latter forms, the statue monument is now commonly dated to the years around 480-470 BC. The family of Callias, the son of Hipponikos, originated from the demos of Alopeke and belonged to the genos of the Kerikes, which together with the Omalpidae shared control over the cult of Demeter and Cori at Eleusis. The source of the family's wealth in the 6th century were agricultural land holdings that formed the economic basis for, um, for hippotrophia, the practice of horse breeding, and the accompanying equestrian victories of Kalias, identically named grandfather in the Pythian and the Olympic Games. Kalias, who was probably born around 520 BC, not only held the hereditary Eleusinian priesthood of the Daduchos since at least 490 BC, but also played an active role as an entrepreneur in the mining industry, possibly at the silver mines of, of Laurion. Um, and the family's reputation for its extraordinary wealth resonated even in the Roman period. By his marriage with Elpinike, the daughter of Miltiades and the sister of Cimon, whose public debts Callias cleared in return, the proverbial Lacoplotos, rich in mining pits, advanced into the orbit of the upper Athenian echelons, short, probably shortly after the death of Miltiades in 489 BC. The history of research on the statue monument of Callias is in a way paradigmatic for a general dilemma of classical studies, and we heard about that a few uh, minutes ago, um, rooted in the increasing scientific divide between classical archaeology on the one hand and ancient history in the form of Greek epigraphy on the other hand since the 19th century. The interest of, epigraph of epigraphical research exhausted itself until very recently in the pleasure of the texts to which the Kalia space had not too much to offer, while the materiality of writing hardly attracted any attention. Köhler's verdict over the inscription of the Kalia space is accordingly symptomatic for a perspective on what I would like to stress actually needs to be interpreted and analyzed as textual layout in its own right. To Köhler's defense, this perspective was also shared by classical archaeology, per se concerned with materiality, 
although with a completely different one at that time. Franz Stutnitzka, who brushed off the inscription as naïf unbedacht, was accordingly above all concerned with the question of what kind of statue was originally standing on the base, even though, and this is striking, he underwent uh, the effort to, to produce a drawing of the base and its inscription with the help of a squeeze and a photo photography, and you can see the drawing of, of, of Stutnitzka on this slide here. This drawing that will concern us again later on was, however, first of all, a methodological instrument for Stutnitzka's Meisterforschung. For it was already Köhler who, in the light of a notice by Posenius, had associated an Aphrodite by the artist Kalamis with the Kalia space. While Stutnitzka put an end to the Kalamis debate, the undoubtedly eminent question of what was standing on top of the Kalia space continued to push a closer analysis of what is actually resting beneath the now lost statue in the background of archaeological interest. In this brief presentation, I'm, I'm going to outline this issue from several angles with the aim to understand the base proper as a fundamental element of the entire statue monument of Kalias in terms of aesthetics and self-representation. And I would like to use this as an opportunity to thank the Acropolis Museum for granting me the permission for an autopsy of the base, as well as Angelique Couvelli and Raphael Jacob for their kind help and hospitality. Back again to the base. With the drawings by Stutnitzka and Rudolf Heberdai in mind, the latter is published, as I have uh, mentioned before, by Raubicek in his dedications from the Athenian Acropolis. The first impression of the Kalias base might come as a slight disappointment, at least it, it came for me, um, for it clearly has not aged well, to put it this way. Um, a considerable piece of the left front corner, I'm, I'm quickly going back to this slide, and I, you can compare this with the drawing by Stutnitzka, so a um, considerable piece of the left front corner is, is uh, still preserved in the early 20th century, is missing today, and most of the inscription is gone, and maybe you are able to, to see some of the traces of the lettering here. Um, a problem, however, that already Raubicek was facing to some extent, who confirmed that, quote, some of the letters given in the earlier publications can no longer be read, end of quote. What is still discernible of the base measuring 64 by 55 centimeters with a height of about 30 centimeters are, on the one hand, the sad cuttings for a bronze statue on the top surface, right here on this, fo on this photo. Um, on the basis of four round dowel holes, it is possible to reconstruct a statue of about 1.9 meters height, standing in a calm pose with both feet resting flat on the base. The right foot here is um, slightly angled outwards, thus differentiating between an engaged and a free lag, one of the main innovations of the severe style. What is quite well preserved, on the other hand, is the dressing of the vertical faces of the block with drafted margins surrounding neat neatly picked fields in the center. And the immense quality of workmanship of this pseudo anathyrosis still manifests today on the right lateral side that you can see on this photo here down below and in a detail here to the right. Um, quickly going back again. Um, unusual is the trimming of the top edges on all sides of the base that you maybe uh, that you maybe see here on this photo and better again on this detail here. And the only comparative example from the Athenian Acropolis that I'm aware of is a slightly older equestrian um, statue base by the otherwise unknown artist Leobios, which is beveled on the top and vertical edges of its front face. And you can see this statue base here to the right on this photo. What seems to become apparent here is, first of all, the desire to, to add additional decoration to these spaces in contrast to their plain contemporary cubic counterparts, and secondly, in the case of the Kalia space, to structure its shape with a formal upper ending. And more elaborate top moldings on low bases did apparently not come into fashion until the middle of the fifth century, as, for example, is illustrated by the well-known base of Kiniskos at Olympia that you can see here down below. 
Let us now turn to two material aspects um, of the Kalia space that merit to be examined in greater detail, the sad surface finish and the layout of the inscription. With its pseudo anathyrosis the Kalia space belongs to a small group of late archaic and early classical statue monuments, mainly but not, exclusive, not, not exclusively from Athens, that employ the visual means of an incompletion in the manufacturing process as decorative elements. The shafts of several column bases from the Athenian Acropolis, for instance, and I'm sh showing you um, one example for this on the left, um, are unfluted and feature a roughly picked surface as if they had just come out of the quarry. In other cases, the ambivalent interplay between constructional purpose and uh, constructional practice and decorative purpose is deliberately broken. This is illustrated by a round base for, a, um, for an Athena statue that you can see here to the right, um, a work by Critios and Nesiotis, whose surface finish with an anathyrosis is not motivated by any functional purpose at all. Um, Catherine Kiesling has most recently argued that the success of this phenomenon with statue monuments of the early 5th century um, needs to be interpreted as a result of its semanticization in the discourses of Athenian com commemorative culture um, after the Persian Wars. The particular dressing of these spaces would have provided accordingly a visual link with the unfinished column drums and blocks of the pre-Parthenon destroyed by the Persians in 480 BC. And, such, and indeed, such an interpretation would resonate in the present case with the biography of Callias, who, according to Plutarch, personally had fought in the Battle of Marathon. Do we have to understand, then, the decoration of the Callias base in terms of self-representation as a proud boast of its donor's battle-tested arete? I'm not entirely convinced by this, and I hope, Cathy, that you don't mind my objections. Um, Contrast, I'm, I'm arguing more detailed in a forthcoming paper, and I'm, I'm summarizing here for the sake of brevity, that the emergence and distribution of this particular surface dressing is related to a massive influx of Ionian and Cycladic stonemasons and artists to late archaic mainland Greece, and especially to Athens, who introduced a new fashion of ionizing aesthetics to material culture, um, for example, to vast painting, architecture, and also to sculpture. In Ionic and Cycladic architecture, the employment of a decorative incompletion can be demonstrated since the 6th century BC, and I'm showing you here just a single example for, for this. The wall blocks with drafted margins on their front faces, and I hope you can make that out on, on, on this photo here, um, from the temple at Sangri on Naxos, dated to the third quarter of the 6th century. In late archaic Athens, we find several Ionian and Cycladic artists, such as Endoios and Philargos, or the Chian artistic family of Archemos and his two sons, Bupalos and Athenis, who were hired not only by Ionian residents. While a base block with pseudo anathyrosis from the Athenian Acropolis is the work of an unknown Chian artist of the early 5th century BC, and you can see this here, Epoios and Archios, um, the old Attic dialect of the inscription seems to point to a local Athenian donor. The strong Ionian influences of a decorative incompletion, I would argue, not only were adopted in turn by other artists such as Critios and Nesiotis, as we have seen before, but also informed the decorative style of Pers several Persian war monuments, such as the column monument of Kalimachos to the left, or the stoa of the Athenians at Delphi to the right, whose steps are dressed again with a pseudo anathyrosis. And in this case, the ionizing architectural aesthetics is reinforced as well by the choice of a really highly unusual type of column base um, that you also can see here on this photo and that circulated in southwestern Asia Minor only for a very brief period after the middle of the 6th century BC. The statue monument of Hegelochos, another work by Critios and Nesiotis, probably to be dated shortly after 480 BC, allows to carry out a cross-check. 
He had the striding, warrior-like pose of the statue and the inscription itself mentioning the toils of Ares, um, Ponon Areos, most likely placed the dedication in a Persian war context. The entirely smooth finish of the block, however, does not need to startle us when we dissociate the discussed surface finish from its semantics as lieu de mémoire and acknowledge its purely aesthetic decorative purpose instead. A purpose I would like to suggest that was employed as well, um, employed as well for the Kalia space. Let us now move on to the inscription that is usually referenced, for instance, in the latest IG volume with the drawing by Hebadai, not at least because Raubicek did not include a photography of the base in his publication. When comparing Hebadai's drawing with the less known one made by Stutnitska, there is an obvious difference in the way that the last five letters um, of the inscription in the horizontal margin are rendered. I hope you, you, you see that on this slide. Even though the inscription on the stone itself is hardly legible today, um, and I try to, to render the remaining traces of the uh, inscription in, in red, and I hope you, you, you're able to see that, um, it is possible to confirm that the equally spaced letters by Stutnitska match the still preserved evidence very well, whereas Heberdai's wider letter spacing proves to be downright erroneous. Or very well, one might say, but does that really matter in the end? It does indeed, and I will demonstrate to you why. The inscription um, starts about 20 centimeters from the former upper left corner of the block, while the text itself follows the standard contemporaneous dedication formula consisting of a name followed by an ethica, this graphical arrangement is in contrast highly peculiar. In the archaic and until well into the classical period, the practice of writing on statue monuments and on their bases in particular was closely determined by the materiality of these objects, insofar as the space for writing which they provided was not conceived as abstract and autonomous. Hence, the letters of the inscription tend to orientate themselves by the physical limits of the blocks. This is, for instance, exactly the reason why the stonemason of the statue base of Praxiteles, that you can see here on top, um, dedicated in the sanctuary of, of Olympia in the early 5th century BC, choose to frame the right end of the inscription with a vertical line um, to prevent it from, um, from floating in the void space of the larger block. Another, another example is offered by the Lyakra space from the Athenian Agora that you can see here down below and in a detail, um, which not only is more or less contemporary with the Kalia space, but also was decorated with a pseudo anathyrosis. Here, the letters of the inscription placed in, in um, the top margin of the base um, characteristically cling to the left and the upper edge of the block. In contrast to what Hebadai's drawing of the Kalia space is, is suggesting with its wide spaced letters, that is to say, and this is really the important aspect, an intentional turning of the inscription at the right end of the block, where allegedly would have been enough space for the entire inscription. We have already seen that this is not the case. Without any space left, the turning of the inscription is therefore, and first of all, a result of the, in this case, certainly intentional indentation of the inscription, right? Um, but possibly not an unwelcome one, since the stonemason would have also had the opportunity to engrave the last letters or even the last word in a second line, as in the case of the Liagra space. Similar layouts can, in fact, be found on various other statue monuments and inscribed objects of the archaic period, for example, on a series of boundary stones from the Athenian Agora dated to about 500 BC, and I'm showing you just one single example here on the left, or outside of Athens on the capital of the funerary column of Xenvaris from Corfu that you see here to the right of the early 6th century BC. In the light of this material-bound practice of writing, 
the indentation of our inscription is clearly in need of an explanation, and the more so as I'm not aware of any striking contemporary comparative examples, at least from Athens. And if you do, please let me know. While it is quite obvious what this graphical arrangement does, it centers the name of Callias not only on the base itself, but also axially beneath the lost statue. It is rather difficult to establish um, its actual meaning, and the more so because this leads us back again to the difficult question about the nature of the statue proper. As neither the pose nor the text of the inscription offer any hard clues as to the statue's identity, we are facing a wide spectrum of possible identifications, including a divinity, and first of all, of course, Athena, or a hero, or in general, a human figure with Callias himself in particular. The purpose of a portrait statue was, first, was at first suggested by Raubicek, who argued that three victories in the chariot race at the Olympic Games, ascribed to Callias by a late antique scolion, provided a suitable occasion for its dedication. A view that has not gone unchallenged, as for example Ralf Krummeis, has raised doubts worth considering against, against such an athletic victory commemoration. As time is getting short, I will focus here on just one but crucial aspect of this larger issue, the question if the unusual graphical arrangement of the inscription was possibly intended to establish a close and formal text-image relation. This question becomes all the more important when we acknowledge the fact that for the practice of writing on Attic statue monuments, this was in general not the case until well into the 5th century BC, as two funerary monuments exemplarily illustrate. In the case of the late archaic funerary monument of Aristion that you can see here to the left, it is highly re remarkable that the inscription naming the deceased in the genitive has not been engraved in what could be perceived as the prime spot directly beneath the feet of the warrior where the artist's signature has been placed instead, um, but on the base of the stele. Here, the adherence to the physical limits of the block, moreover, virtually denies any visual link with the figurative representation. The stele of Amfarete, in contrast to the right, one of the, on one of the early examples after the revival of Attic funerary sculpture around 430 BC displays a completely different layout strategy um, insofar as the nominative name of the deceased here um, has strikingly not been engraved in relation to the overall architecture of the Naiskos that is centered on the entablature, but in an eccentric position immediately placed above the head of the female figure. What we see here is in fact an expression of a wider phenomenon of addressing identity at the turn from the 5th to the 4th century BC. Around the same time, nominative name labels regularly started to appear as well on statue bases, for example on those of athletic um, victors at Olympia, what um, Catherine Kiesling has very convincingly explained in the context of a new documentary habit. What seems to be a distinct change in the practice of writing on statue monuments at the end of the fifth century was however not as clear cut as one might think on first sight as the statue base of the victorious boxer Euthymos of Locri at Olympia reveals. It is commonly thought to have been dedicated shortly after, Euth um, after Euthymos' last victory in 472 BC, and such a date is at least to some extent confirmed by the employed method of mounting the statue on the base, the, the Samian technique, which seems to have gone out of use in the early classical period, and I hope this is, this is still true. <laughs> um, on the front face of the base and below an epigram um, has been um, engraved a second text block um, including the name of Euthymos and his ethnicon, so Euthymos, Locros, Apocyphirio, and followed by Anethica, as well as in a second line the artist's signature. If we acknowledge the fact that, that Anethica, and this is really communis opinio, is a later addition as the differing, differing letter forms and th their spacing prove beyond any doubt, 
and that it probably went hand in hand with the rasura in the second line of the epigram, the purpose of this textual layout becomes clear. The name of Euthymos is thus not only centered on the base, but also beneath the figurative representation on top. In this case, certainly a portrait statue of the athlete and Akon in the words of the epigram. Returning to the Callias base, it is quite clear that Olympia represents in many ways an exceptional case for the ostentatious display of um, individual and in turn individualized accomplishment. And it is quite striking that around the same time a new epigraphic formula made its appearance on victory bases in the sanctuary thought to echo the Angelia, the official victory proclamation. But even so, were the contemporaneous recipients at Athens, of course, very well familiar with the conceptual spatial arrangement of images and texts in the form of name labels from other visual media, such as vase or wall paintings. And I'm showing you here a really random um, um, attic red figured Arabulus, which, however, is all more or less contemporary with the Kalia space. In this slide, I would like to suggest that the inscription on the Kalias base, beyond a mere visual emphasis of the donor's name, was indeed intentionally arranged in such a way to motivate a semantic link with the figurative representation on top. Within this perspective, it very well might have been a male figure that at least momentarily allowed the potential association with its donor, if not ultimately a portrait statue of Kalias himself. In contrast to the explicit naming practice of the late 5th century, this text image relation remained, however, far more ambiguous in its nature, as the text of the inscription adhered to a common genre and formula on contemporary, contemporaneous statue monuments. This vagueness is maybe no coincidence in early classical Athens, where individualization in public imagery, either by the way of iconography or by means of textual explanation, had the potential to be perceived as problematic, if not anti-democratic. Such, such sentiments certainly resonated in the public discussion on the painting on the, of the Battle of Marathon that adorned the Stoa Porchile and the question of whether the figure of Miltiades should be identified with an inscription or not. In the case of the Kalia statue monument and its negotiation of identity, social distinction then seems to be achieved by a playful balancing act on the borders of a particular elite habitus and a barely accepted social deviance. Finally, in comparison with other classical statue, monu statue monuments from the Acropolis, this self-representation was characterized but what, by what might be called a reduction of, of outer forms. Neither did visibility and vertical superelevation seem to have been important aspects that, for example, did the, the, determined the roughly two decades younger dedication of Timotheos, a column monument with yet again an unfinished surface de decoration that you can see here to the left, um, nor the monumentality of the four horse chariot of Pronapes to the right. Um, that uh, potentially include a portrait of the victorious member of the Athenian elite. All that we can be more or less sure of is that in the case of Kalia's statue monument, money was probably not the limiting factor. To conclude, in his dedications from the Athenian Acropolis, Antony Raubicek characterized the large group of archaic and classical low bases as having, quote, no artistic value of their own. They merely serve as substructures for marble or bronze statues, end of quote. At this conference, it might, might seem rather redundant to advocate for the exact opposite, that is to consider the materiality of statue bases and their inscriptions in their own rights, in other words, as archaeological objects. I hope to have demonstrated, nevertheless, that the Kalia space is a good example of why exactly to do so, even if there are questions that have been left unanswered in this presentation. Let me point out again two important observations instead. First of all, the Kalia space was to an extraordinary extent adorned with decorative elements, that is with the otherwise rarely attested beveled top edges and with a surface finish that gave it an air of ionic aesthetics. Um, and situated it in current discourses of Athenian elite self-representation. Not at least due to the quality of 
of workmanship, the base thus constituted in a way a visual counterweight to the statue it carried, maybe with the intention to raise awareness to the close relation of text and image. In spite of a boasting, conspicuous consumption, the self-representation of Kalia seems to have been determined then by far more subtle and sophisticated undertones. Thank you. Thank you.